Ah, Tyrion, the great defender of the High Elves. More like the great pretender of the High Elves, only useful to warm the bed of the Ever Queen. A skilled warrior and a fearsome and unbreakable foe on the battlefield, but lacking the strategic thinking that's required to lead armies. Nothing, then, but a warmonger who craves battle. Then there is the curse of his ancestor that courses through his veins, a bloodline tainted by the actions of his forefathers. It is no surprise that he is so quick to take up arms and throw his people into senseless conflicts. But do not mistake his martial prowess for wisdom or strategy. His arrogance and short-sightedness have led him and his armies to defeat time and time again. He is nothing more than a reckless brawler, unable to see the bigger picture beyond his own glory and ego. At least some of us can hold a sword and defend our people, you hateful, vengeful brute. Tell me, have you managed to aim your bow yet? Or are you simply saving that for the one shot against Malekith, provided you ever manage to catch him, while you strut around the lands of the Dark Elves uncaring over the fate of others? I defend our capital, our people, and our precious heritage. It is I who is the shield of the High Elves. Stop trying to impress your girlfriend, boy. Welcome everyone, Questine here with my campaign overview guide for Tyrion of the High Elves, one of the more powerful legendary lords in the game, and certainly one of the best campaigns you can play in the game if you're starting out Immortal Empires. I strongly recommend playing the Lost God Champion prologue first before cool. jumping into Immortal Empires, maybe playing a bit of Realms of Chaos, The Realms of Chaos is a bad tool to learn the game. But either way, Tyrion certainly has one of the best campaigns if you're a new player. But if you're an experienced player, it's still a good campaign because Tyrion does have plenty of opportunities of expansion, he has a good amount of power, he has good faction effects. So overall, a really good Legendary Lord for a pretty good the faction. A bit generic, certainly. Legendary Lords like Alariel, Alifanar, Elfarian do have a lot more going in their campaigns. But they don't, they don't necessarily reach the same level of power that Tyrion can have. He is absolutely ridiculous. Faction-wide effects, he gets... 10 diplomatic relations with High Elves, which is pretty important because High Elves do depend on trade. This will also help your confederations, your military alliances, all of that. You get minus 50% construction time for the Shrine of Cain, but to be quite honest, this is not exactly the benefit that you might think. Because the Shrine of Cain is over here, and basically you're just reducing this plus 100% construction time for this building to 50%. So it's still going to take a long time to be able to get the Sword of Cain, though you may not necessarily even care about the Sword of Cain when you're playing as Tyrion. I'll get into that in just a second. Then you get the recruitment time duration uh, minus one per turn for infantry and cavalry units. The infantry part is actually significant because you can get uh, good infantry units faster if you're playing as Tyrion. So Sword, Ma Sword Master of Hoef, Phoenix Guard, all of that kind of stuff. Protected. On top of that, when we're talking about Tyrion, you also have his Lord effects. He gets a minus 50% upkeep for Spearmen, Silver and Guard, Rangers, Archers, and Silver Helms. It's really the Spearmen, Silver and Guard, and Archers aspect that's really important. Basically, Spearmen and Archers are the backbone of the High Elven army. In fact, your Tier 1 units are so good that you can play an entire campaign just using Spearmen on Archers. Maybe getting some artillery, but that's about it. In fact, plenty of people have done exactly that. Because by using these units, which are relatively cheap to maintain, you can maintain more armies and have a lot more power around the campaign map. That is significant when it comes down to it. Silver and Guard, of course, are a tier 3 uh, infantry unit. More expensive, but significantly better than the regular Spearmen. So still pretty solid when it comes down to it. You generally want to get the barracks, at least at tier 1, to be able to get the archers with light armor. They're just a better version of the regular archers without armor. Though the regular archers without armor are just cheaper to maintain and produce. But you can look at the upkeep situation here. He's only play paying 60 or so upkeep for these units, which is very cheap. In fact, it's probably some of the best upkeep in the entire game for units that are this good. Like, you look at Spearmen, they're pretty solid. They don't do a lot of damage, but they do form a solid wall of shields. And Archers have a ridiculous amount of range in combat. On top of that, Tyrion does have uh, the ability of choosing a skill line. He also gets recruit rank plus three for Lauder and Seaguard. Though I would say argue that Lauder and Seaguard, a couple of them won't go amiss, but not necessarily too many of them. Basically, these guys are a hybrid unit. They're pretty decent in melee, but they're also decent in range. Not quite the same range as archers, but still uh, fairly solid 
in quite a few ways. Not the same ammunition, not the same range, but still being able to do quite a lot, uh, quite a lot in combat. Though bear in mind they do have fewer models, um, or do they have fewer models? No, it's actually the exact same models. I, I'm a bit mistaken on that subject. Anyway. So Laudrin Sea Guard is still pretty uh, powerful as a range unit. As a melee unit, less so when it comes to, uh, when it comes down to that, though certainly they do have better stats, but because of the fewer models, um, the better stats are not necessarily going to be uh, that significant. Still, pretty good uh, starring army over here with Spearmen, Laudrin Sea Guards, Silver Helms, and a f uh, Phoenix. A fire Phoenix, basically. Now, in terms of his special skill line, he gets a choice between Majesty of Ulfwan or Bloodline of Anarian. Bloodline of Anarian improves Tyrion's combat skill, which is great, but do you really need that as Tyrion? Because he is an absolute machine in combat, especially with the items that he gets. He gets free quest items. One of them basically requires you to take the Phoenix Gate over here. It's likely a, a Lariel is going to take that before you. There used to be a bug when Immortal Empires came out that you wouldn't get this item if a Lariel beat you to it which could cause a lot of problems during the course of your campaign. But they fixed that, so you can get it. Then he has two quest battles. Those are also bugged, though thankfully they have been fixed. The Heart of Avalorn is insane. Kasterian has pretty good stats. And effectively, he can't really be killed all that easily in a battle between the ward save, the armor, the sheer combat potential he has in battle, and then restoring HP when he drops below 25% HP is absolutely ridiculous when it comes down to it so a great deal of combat power so going with the uh the bloodline of an Aryan, which costs you control both faction wide and on a local level just doesn't seem all that great compared to the majesty of wolf one so this gives you an army leadership benefit a melee defense uh benefit for allies in range more diplomatic relations with high elves control in all provinces 30 percent income in the local province which doesn't really matter all that much because your legendary lord should always be moving to new conquests so it's not really that important recruitment cost minus 10 percent for all armies global recruitment duration of minus one turn now that global recruitment duration situation what that really means if i just move Tyrion over here it means they can recruit a lot of units that would otherwise take two turns in one turn. And obviously you can recruit every other unit faster through the global recruitment. And you also get plus two to global recruitment capacity. So you can pump out more armies faster if you're playing as Tyrion, faction-wide. Then minus 10% upkeep for all armies, minus 10 corruption in all provinces. The corruption benefit doesn't really matter that much. It's kind of like a leftover from Warhammer 2. There are certainly some things, some effects on Legendary Lords throughout the entire game that were carried over from previous games that just don't make sense within the context of Warhammer 3. Because corruption really isn't that much of an issue anymore uh, in Warhammer 3. So you should always go for Majesty of Wolf 1. Now, let's talk about his campaign plan. So rely on spearmen and archers. A couple of spearmen, mainly archers, unleash the archer doom stack of the high elves on your enemies. One of the problems that you're going to encounter, you do start with a tier 2 settlement and you do already have a barracks built and you should probably get these two structures very quickly. Both of these are economic structures uh, in one way or another, though this one is also uh, doubling down as a control structure, but it can still generate a fair amount of income, especially in a provincial capital if you get to the highest level. And if you achieve control of 100 in a province as a high elves, your economic structures are going to generate quite a bit more income. The thing is, High Elves do depend on trade to be able to generate their income because their main economic structure, the Elven Fairground chain, also generates trade resources. And the Elven Chests are actually one of the more expensive uh, trade resources in the game, so they'll sell for more. Basically what this means, Tyrion wants to get trade agreements. He can get one with Alarial very quickly, he can get one with Alarian as well fairly quickly, as well as military axis. If you're playing this campaign diplomatically, you want to make deals with Alarian, Alarial, and Elfarian here to the east, so you don't, come, uh, you don't have contact with him from the very start. A bit uh, silly, if you ask me, that you don't actually start in contact with all the High Elven factions in Wolf 1. You should have vision over all of Wolf 1 from the very beginning. When it comes down to it. Now, your campaign plan, take out this army. I would strongly recommend, regardless of the difficulty you're playing the game on, that you always fight battles manually. At least early on in the campaign. You should only out-resolve when the casualties that you're taking out are low, and when you have good uh, casualty replenishment. I know it's annoying, believe me. I've played enough campaigns in this game to know it's annoying have to, having to do that. The loading screens can be annoying, but it's what I recommend. You also get more experience, in my experience, if you're fighting battles manually, 
in a campaign than not resolving them, especially on lower difficulties when you're not resolving them. Just my personal experience. Now, you only start at war with one faction, the Cult of Excess, who controls most of Etain. So you want to drive them out. They have one army here. It's insignificant that they have another army here in the Shrine of Asurian. Now, defeating this army and taking the Tower of Lycian should be your top priority. Very, very easy to do. You also start with the Mage, focus on Heavens. Not necessarily the best uh, school of magic to have as starting one, though Chain Lightning and Comet of Cassandora can be useful, but I do prefer different magic uh, sculpturings. Now, you should defeat this army, take the Tower of Lycian, and you should also, once you do that, recruit another Lord. Now, the Lord you should be looking at, because you're not going to have influence. So, without influence, High Elves just recruit Lords with negative stats. What you're really looking for is a negative stat that doesn't really matter. So, physical resistance and melee attack isn't really that great. There is one that can be really good if you can get it uh, early on in campaign. The lords here are randomized, so sometimes you might just want to start your campaign again and again until you can get the lord of a good school of magic, like for instance, high magic or, or metal, that does have a negative trait that isn't a problem. Uh, in this case, um, the lore of life archmage here has ridic ridiculed, which just increases recruitment direction plus one for phoenix units. Phoenix units are okay, but it's like certainly not a priority. So you should recruit this lord in Lofburn on turn one and start global recruitment with her. And the reason you want to start global recruitment with her from turn one comes down to this particular fact when, uh, when it boils down to it. You want to recruit a lot of units very, very quickly in your campaign. Yes, it's going to cost money. Sure. And you should choose the post-battle option here that gives you money. But the reason you're doing so is because you want to have as many troops and as quickly as possible over here to wipe this faction out very, very quickly and expand very quickly. That's the key to success in a campaign. Also, having a second army means your army can win a Salem battle, uh, sack it, and then just keep moving. Or you can use the second army to attack the settlement. Your main army comes as reinforcement and then still has movement points. This can be pretty significant in campaign when you're trying to conquer a lot of territory quickly. And aggression, as I've established in a guide on this very subject, which I'll link at the end of this video, is actually important to achieving success. So making diplomatic relations with Illyrian, Illyrial, and Alfarian as you encounter him is important. You should ignore Terranok. In every way that matters. Don't make any deals, even when they offer it. You can achieve good diplomatic relations with them. And also ignore Kalador, or even outright conquer Kalador. But here's what your campaign plan should be. Take out this army, take out the Tower of Lycian. Then on turn two, with your army from Lawford, you take the Tower of Lycian with Tyrion. And on turn two, you should have enough movement points that if you force march over here you should be able to take this element out like this army is going to be doing the attacking but i believe that Tyrion has enough movement points if i'm not mistaken on the subject to be able to march from here all the way to here with force march could be wrong just bear in, bear in mind but i don't believe i am i've played this campaign plenty of times and even if he doesn't have then just attack it on turn three take this out take the, uh, the army here should uh, when they're seeing you advance towards this particular port they might even move out of here from the Shrine of Asturian. So even waiting an extra turn, if you have to, might actually be the better decision because the garrison here is only six units. The garrison here is 11 units because this is a higher level settlement and it also has the Watchtower. So this is a, actually a more difficult battle. If you can move this, uh, if you can get this army, lure this army out of here, which will happen on higher difficulties more often than lo on lower ones. But if you can lure this army out of here, you will have an easier battle to take the Shrine of Asturian. Those are your early game turns. What do you do after that particular situation? Now, Noctilus over here, he's going to start a war with Kalador, and he's going to conquer Kalador in short order. Or, or he's going to do a lot of damage, especially on higher difficulties. Now, for whatever reason, I started this on normal. I need to change my difficulty settings. But anyway, uh, he's going to take a Kalador, pull up, put a lot of pressure on them, and he's also going to put pressure on Terranok. Let him. You've got other fish to fry, more important fish to fry. What you should do in this campaign Shield against the is once you've taken this entire province and recruiting a full stack of units, you move on Safari. The reason you want to move on Safari is it's a fairly protected province, with the exception of the port here, which can be vulnerable. But outside of that, it's a fairly well-protected province. And Safari, you don't have good relations with them. They're also under Nakari's influence, so you want to deal with that situation fairly quickly. 
Uh, once you've dealt with Safari, and hopefully quickly enough that Alariel doesn't just snatch this uh, settlement over here and create issues in your campaign, but once you've dealt with that situation, uh, you can move over here to take this particular settlement. Alfarian, who starts here, he's going to take... Uh, he's going to take the settlement likely on turn one or very shortly thereafter, and then he's going to start working on Southern Everest. Once you've taken Safari, I mean, it can be a difficult battle on higher difficulties, but once you've taken Safari, you should try and conquer this province, or at least portions of it. It's not necessarily a province you want to hold. In fact, you might want to sell it to Alfarian in order to get the military alliance with him. It can help you out a great deal over here, and it will also make Alfarian more useful. Like, you want Safari for yourself, uh, but uh, you might want to sell this particular province for yourself uh, to Alfarian. But you might also ignore this province completely because Alfarian will eventually wipe out these greenskins on, on his own and just march quickly to deal with Noctilus over here or conquer Kalador and then deal with Noctilus. Eliminating Noctilus eliminates one of the major threats. But the thing is, Noctilus also has the Gallon Graveyard. It's not really a difficult settlement to take. It has a garrison that's relatively weak when we're talking about uh, about it, uh, so it shouldn't really be a problem to win this particular ba battle, like your units will tear these guys to shreds. One of the things I would recommend, if you're going to attack the Galleon Graveyard, come all the way around here and attack from the south, because if you just order an attack move directly, your army will land here, take attrition, you'll be able to attack on the next turn, but it's just needless attrition. Uh, holding the Galleon Graveyard, you should stop the income. The benefit here is that it prevents attrition at sea, or a lot of attrition at sea. Once you've dealt with all of that, Kalador, Noctilus, you may want to take Terranoc very quickly. Bear in mind that while all of this is happening, you'll be getting quest battles as well. You should do those quest battles. They're not too difficult if you have a full stack of spearmen and archers. Uh, neither of them is, is difficult uh, to deal with. Uh, conquer Terranoc and then move north to either take this province or ignore this province. Ignore everything that's happening here in the north with Nakari. There's several reasons behind this. One, typically speaking, Alfarian and Alarial will be able to handle the situation on their own if you eliminate the pressure that's coming from Noctilus. So eliminating Noctilus removes pressure from them, means they don't have to worry about them, means Alarian can help out. So you can ignore everything that's happening here, or you conquer Terranoc, take the Griffin Gate, take the Selment, uh, and maybe... Um, Maybe even take their capital if you really want to feel like it. Um, but I would probably just take this element. By this point, Alarial may have the Phoenix Gate. Sell this element to Alarian, or just keep it until Alarial eventually takes their capital and sell it to her in exchange for money and better diplomatic relations. Once you deal with that, she'll take the Shrine of Cain. She'll also move on to Kari. Now, from what people have told me, if you don't own Alarial's DLC or Alfarian's DLC, you can't confederate with them. So your campaign plan may be different. But I honestly can't say that. I've owned the DLC for both of them for a fairly long time, so it's difficult for me to be able to figure it out. The other reason you don't want to go over here in the north is because Bellacor over here will gain vision next to you, and he'll constantly launch invasions. It's not something you want to deal with. Of course, uniting all of Wolf 1 can be great, but you should rely on diplomacy that you can confederate Alarian, you can confederate Alarial once enough time has passed, and if you expand aggressively in other territories. So once you take Terranoc and maybe toward the Nil uh, over here, Adrenil, and sell it to either Illyrian or Alarial, what should your next campaign plan be? Well, you could obviously deal with Akari, Kotik, all that kind of stuff, right? Well, don't declare war on Kotik, Alfarian will hate you for it. But one of your main targets should be Marafi. Marafi can be a fairly substantial threat in this campaign, so eliminating her relatively quickly can give you a lot of campaign benefits during the course of the campaign. She does have a great province over here on the Titan Peaks. And also, if you take Iron Spike in particular, which Marafi certainly will do, and then this element as well, you can then sell these to Hexoatl and get a military alliance with Mazda Mundi. Now what Mazda Mundi is going to do is he's generally going to win the fights he has. It's gonna take him time, but once he does so, he's going to be in a dominant position. He generally, on legendary very hard at least, becomes one of the strongest factions in the entire game. So having him as an ally will secure the entire south for you, secure this part of the world. You might actually want uh, to take out this entire province for yourself, eliminate the Skaven, if Marafi hasn't done it already. She might just very well do so. 
So take this province, but of course also take the Bleak Coast, potentially, or just land directly at Grey Rock Point, ignore the Bleak Coast, go directly for Morafi Eliminator, and then worry about the Bleak Coast. This is a minor Dark Elven faction, and minor factions are less significant than Legendary Lord factions. So these guys are not the priority, then move north. When you move north, you're likely going to encounter the Sisters of Twilight. Kill them. Wipe them out, really. I'm not joking on this. There's no benefit in having a Wood Elf ally because the AI in general will not help you out unless... Um, or the AI will not deal with your enemies unless they have a direct territorial link to them. So you want this province for yourself, by the way. It is a good province. It has some good effects, by the way. So you want to take this for yourself. And if you sack the Witchwood, you should always sack the Witchwood. And then take it over and then sell it to Katep. You can get a much better alliance with Katep, who is actually a far more useful ally uh, than the sisters can be. Then move, move over here to the north, take out uh, the Hearthstone that Tarx is going to uh, put down. Start resettling this province, move north, you'll encounter a Leaf and Ar, help him out against Silostra, and then move north to deal with Nagrond. That's your campaign plan. In the meantime, Nakari. Uh, will be dealt with one way or another. If you have to interfere because they're just Elfarian and Alariel can't handle it, though they should uh, do so, but it's not your priority. Your priority is the southern situation and the western situation of Wolf 1. It's not the northern situation of Wolf 1. That is Alariel's uh, problem. That's Elfarian's problem if you're playing the, their campaigns. So it's not Tarian's issue when it comes down to it. By the way, move north, the old side of get diplomatic relations with Alifanar. Alifanar will have plenty of enemies. Start getting those diplomatic relations. He won't care much for you, but if you wipe out Salostra and give him the Cloud Coast, he will certainly appreciate it. What you really want is the Obsidian Peaks because Clark Courant here has an amazing landmark that can generate you a lot of trade resources. That means a lot of trade agreements. That's how you'll encounter Malekith. Wipe him out because one of your campaign objectives is to wipe out bo both Marafi and Malekith. Do so, and then just conquer all of this territory. If Grombrindle is still alive by the time you arrive there, you might want to sell a lot of the mountainous regions over here to him, or you might want to just what, take out Grombrindle yourself and get to, give it to Katep, because I'm not sure Grombrindle or Katep will get along. That's one of the problems you can encounter here. Most of the time, though, uh, Grombrindle will be wiped out by Malakif, so that cool scene in the Immortal Empire's launch trailer is likely not going to be replicated, unless you're playing Grombrindle yourself. Um, but either way, Grombrindle or Katep, you want a faction to actually take this western part, and then take the northern castways, deal with Valkia, if someone else hasn't dealt with Valtkia, Mr. Sigvold, S uh, stabilize the situation here, give all of this territory, like what you see over here until here, give it to an ally, and meanwhile you go deal with Bellacor at this point, and then you go deal with other things in your campaign. Unfortunately, one of the problems for the High Elves is that a lot of the terrain types outside of Nagrond and Wolf 1 aren't actually suitable uh, for them, so you actually have few campaign expansion opportunities in the end game that are there are that aren't either unpleasant or unsuitable climate completely it is one of the downsides when it comes to playing this campaign maybe playing with a mod that eliminates the penalties on climate could actually be the best way to play this campaign in a very very long term situation but that's up to you really if you want to use a mod like that Tarian's campaign once you deal with um with Malekith, with Morafi, and Hellebron, who is also going to pose a significant challenge. Like Malekith, he's kind of pathetic, actually, in the AI. Hellebron, however, she is a different beast altogether. You'll encounter a far bigger challenge for from Hellebron and Valkia than you ever will from uh, Malekith, unless he confederates uh, other factions. Then th that's a different discussion completely. But Malekith, he has a complicated situation, and his AI does struggle to get it going. You might even consider beelining it to Malekith to wipe it out very quickly and save from Brindle, if that's your decision and then dealing with Marafi, that's another campaign plan. Your long campaign victory conditions do require you to deal with all of the Dark Elven factions. Uh, usually speaking, Malice Arcblade, for all his power, will generally be wiped out by the, well, confluence of uh, the Chaos factions that surround him that hate him. If not, Sigvold will eventually wipe him out. Hopefully by the time you actually arrive to deal with Sigvald. Sigvald can actually be the most powerful Chaos Lord in the entire game of the Warriors of Chaos. Because he has very few uh, enemies that can challenge him. The Dark Elves don't particularly hate him. So he's likely going to conquer a lot of Dark Fortresses. If you want to get involved in a long-term war in the Chaos Waste against him, that's your decision. That's really up to you. I'd probably set up a... I'll, I'd probably take Albion, set up a defense force over here against Wolfric and the Norskans. 
uh, and then use the C lane that exists over here. This C lane will take you here. That way you can come down here, all the way down here, and take uh, this particular province, or the Blood Hole specifically, and with that, and really with the Blood Hole itself being the provincial capital and being suitable terrain, that's great, and then come all the way down here and wipe out Rakarth. Try and make friends with the Lizardmen, they can be useful allies. Uh, there's another sea lane over here. The reason you're doing all of this, by the way, there's a sea lane over here that will take you to Cafe, and there, there's one even further south that will also take you to Cafe, so you can deal with Loki or Feralheart, assuming the Cafeans don't beat you to it, which they might or might not. It's always a bit in flux what happens in Cafe. Sometimes you might arrive in Cafe, and Loki is one of the more powerful factions around, and he's allied with Snitch, which is always a fun experience. Or uh, he isn't, he's dead. You'll figure it out. Just pay attention uh, to see on these victory conditions before you decide to do anything if these factions have been wiped out or not. Typically speaking, Rakarf, the Thousand Mods, is going to have a decent amount of survivability. And you're certainly going to have to wipe them out if you want to achieve this uh, long campaign victory condition within any reasonable time frame. Speaking about endgame crises, the possibilities are the sisters over here in the Witchwood, Grumbrindle over here, um, don't know Skaven, uh, no Greenskin uh, to deal with in the course of your campaign and in your immediate uh, territory. Though you might have to deal with the Skaven one under Ekekla because the Terret, because the Shrine of Loak here, and you'll eventually confederate uh, Elfarian if you have this his DLC. Um, the Shrine of Loic might be vulnerable to naval invasions from Ekekla. Wood Elves also have the entirety of Athlorn, so they might become a problem. Grom with the Greenskin campaign and Game Crisis might also be an issue to deal with on the eastern side. Depends on what you're getting. Though you should be relatively safe from Ekekla and Grom's uh, end game Crisis. I'd really be more concerned about the Dwarves or the Sisters when it comes to an end game Crisis potential. I probably wouldn't enable the Dwarf one or the Wood Elf one if you're playing this campaign. Just having to send your armies to deal with the sisters spawning the Witchwood on in Game Crisis is not necessarily a fun experience. That's my perspective. Anyway, that's all there is to this campaign. Questine signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.